Let's turn in our Bibles to Acts chapter 19, and tonight uh, we begin with uh, verse 13. There were certain vagabond Jews who were exorcists. Now, the word vagabond uh, is a reference to people who traveled around, usually in company, and they, would, they just were itinerant type of people, just uh, constantly moving from place to place. Uh, sort of like uh, the modern-day gypsies, uh, many of them are just sort of, uh, I, you know, they just move around from one city to another across the United States or around the world. Uh, and so these Jews uh, would go into an area and they would uh, make a living by exorcism. And these rites of exorcism were... Uh, Practiced in those days, uh, there was just an awful lot of uh, demon possession or uh, people that were possessed by evil spirits, and uh, they uh, had all of these superstitions, they had all of these incantations, uh, they had all of these uh, rituals that they would go through, and sometimes uh, taking a week, two weeks of these rituals and uh, banging of drums and things by which they were seeking to drive out the demons. But these particular vagabond Jews no doubt had come across Paul and they saw how that Paul, just in the name of Jesus, commanded the demons to come out and they did. And so they were taken up by this and so they figured that they would just follow the formula that Paul used uh, in uh, delivering people from demonic powers. And so uh, they got hold of this fellow who was demon-possessed. And uh, it says that uh, they said to him, The name of the Lord, they, they said to him, in the name of the Lord Jesus, we adjure you or we command you by Jesus whom Paul preaches. It's interesting. The demons are subject to the name of Jesus. They have to be. That is, the name of Jesus when it is used by one in whom Jesus Christ is dwelling. When Jesus sent the 70 disciples out uh, to the areas where he would be going, he told them to heal the sick, to cleanse the leper, and to cast out the devils. And so when they returned to Jesus, we read in Luke ten seventeen, they said, Lord, even the devils are subject unto us through your name. But it is the name of Jesus in relationship with him that is important. They got hold of this man. They commanded him, and the evil spirit in him to come out, we adjure you by Jesus whom Paul preaches. Now we are told that these seven men were actually brothers. They were the sons of a man whose name was Sceva, and he was said to be a chief priest, but it doesn't say a chief priest of what, and that we don't know. But the evil spirit responded, Paul I know, Jesus I know, but who are you? <laughs> a second-hand relationship with Jesus is never valid. It cannot be Jesus who Paul preaches. It must be Jesus who dwells in me. Someone has said, 
and rightfully so. God has no grandchildren. Each one of us must have our own personal relationship with Jesus Christ. There are those who are trusting in the fact that their family is Christian or their mother and father were Christians or their grandparents were Christians and they're trying to ride into heaven on the coattails of their parents. It will never work. You have to have your own personal relationship with Jesus Christ. The Bible clearly teaches that every man will be responsible to God for his own deeds. In the Old Testament, during the time that the children of Israel went into captivity to Babylon, there was a proverb that became uh, used a lot by the people. And that proverb was, Our fathers have eaten sour grapes and our teeth are set on edge. And uh, Jeremiah, who of course uh, was the prophet in Jerusalem at the time of the fall to Babylon, and Ezekiel, uh, the prophet who was in Babylon, taken a captive there, both of them make reference to this proverb, which shows to us that it was being used a lot after the fall to Babylon. And they were trying to blame their calamity upon their fathers. And the Lord said, not so. If your teeth are set on edge, it's because you have eaten the sour grapes. So in Jeremiah he said, in those days they shall no say no more, the fathers have eaten the sour grapes, the children's teeth are set on edge. But every one shall die for his own iniquity. Every man that eats the sour grape, his teeth shall be set on edge. The father shall not be put to death for the children, neither shall the children be put to death for the fathers. For every man shall be put to death for his own sin is the law in Deuteronomy 24, 16. You are each of us, you are each of you, and I sing to myself, responsible for the things that we do. And we really can't blame others, which is a common thing. Uh, I just grew up at the wrong time. When I was growing up, it was always the kid's fault. And then as I got older, it was always the parent's fault. And uh, I just hit the wrong ages, I guess. Uh, but uh, we're always wanting to place our, the blame for our problems on someone else, aren't we? Our fathers have eaten sour grapes. And now our teeth are set in edge. Said, not so. If your teeth are on edge, it's because you have eaten the sour grapes. Ezekiel said, the soul that sinneth, it shall die. The son will not bear the iniquity of the father, neither will the father bear the iniquity of the son. The righteousness of the righteous shall be upon him, and the wickedness of the wicked shall be upon him. When you stand before God, you will have no one to give an account for except yourself. Every one of us shall give an account of himself to the Lord. I won't have to give an account for my children. They won't have to give an account for me. Each of us will give an account for ourselves to the Lord. There is only one who can answer for you other than yourself when you stand before God and that is Jesus Christ. And if you've put your trust in Jesus Christ, the glorious thing that when you stand before God, he will stand before you. And we will stand before God in his righteousness that God has imputed to us by our faith in Jesus Christ. Now, these fellows were trying a second-hand relationship. We adjure you by Jesus, whom Paul preaches, come out. And the man in whom was the evil spirit leaped on them. He overcame them. He prevailed against them, and they fled out of the house naked and wounded. 
In the scriptures, we read of when people were possessed by an evil spirit, it could be manifested in many different ways. And sometimes it was manifested in a supernatural strength. In Mark's gospel, uh, chapter 5, he records, And when Jesus was come out of the ship, immediately there met him out of the tombs a man with an unclean spirit, who had his dwelling among the tombs. And no man could bind him, no, not even with chains, because he had been often bound with fetters and chains, and the chains had been plucked asunder by him, and the fetters broken in pieces, and neither could any man tame him. And always, night and day, he was in the mountains and in the tombs, crying and cutting himself with stones. And so the demonic power was manifested in supernatural strength. They couldn't bind him with chains. He could just break them with the supernatural strength of the demon. Oftentimes, the presence of an evil spirit in a person was manifested in physical infirmities. In Matthew 9.32, we read uh, that as... Uh, they were going out. Behold, they brought to Jesus a man who uh, was a mute, and he was possessed with the devil. And when the devil was cast out, the mute was able to speak, and the multitudes marveled, saying, We have never seen this in Israel. And so his, the demon that possessed him had taken control of his vocal cords, and he was unable to speak. Uh, in Matthew twelve twenty two, Then there was brought unto Jesus one that was possessed with the devil, and he was blind and mute, and Jesus healed him inasmuch as he was able to see, and he was able to speak. In Luke thirteen eleven, And behold, there was a woman which had a spirit of infirmity for 18 years, and she was bowed or bowed together, uh, at the uh, waist, the body was bent and uh, the head is actually down by the feet and, and uh, she was in this horrible condition and she could in no wise lift herself up. And when Jesus saw her, he called her to him and he said unto her, Woman, you are loosed. From your infirmity. And he laid his hands on her, and immediately she was made straight and glorified God. And the ruler of the synagogue answered with indignation because Jesus had healed her on the Sabbath day. And he said to the people, There are six days in which men ought to work, and in them therefore uh, come, and there are six days in which men ought to work. In them therefore, Come and be healed and not on the Sabbath day. So he's rebuking the people. You know, don't come on the Sabbath. You have six days. Come in those. Then the Lord answered him and said, You hypocrite. Do not each one of you on the sa Sabbath day loose his ox or his donkey from the stall and lead him away to water him? And ought not this woman, being a daughter of Abraham, whom Satan hath bound, lo, these eighteen years be loosed from her bond on the Sabbath day. Now, oftentimes, demon possession was manifested by these different types of physical infirmities, but it is extremely wrong and dangerous to make an assumption because a person has some kind of a physical malady that it is demon possession. Rare, extremely rare, is demon possession, and it can be attributed just very rarely to a person's physical condition. And it would be shameful, it would be cruel, it would be unscriptural, it would be wrong to assume because a person 
uh, is deaf or a person is blind or whatever, that it is a result of a demonic activity. That would be completely wrong to make that kind of an assumption. And God help us that we wouldn't be guilty of such a cruel thing. Sometimes a person when demon possessed would manifest self-destruction tendencies. In Matthew 17, uh, when Jesus and James and Peter and John had come down from the Mount of Transfiguration, when they had come to the multitude that was waiting at the bottom of the hill, there came to him a certain man that was kneeling down and saying, Lord, have mercy on my son. He's a lunatic. He is sore vexed. Oftentimes he falls into the fire and oftentimes into the water. And I brought him to your disciples and they could not cure him. Then Jesus answered and said, O oh, faithless and perverse generation, how long shall I be with you? How long shall I suffer you? Bring him to me. And Jesus rebuked the devil and he departed out of him and the child was cured from the very hour. So it would seem that the demon would throw him in the fire or cause him to fall into the water to drown him or to burn him. And that self-destructive nature. And many times I believe uh, that uh, a demon is prone to try to destroy uh, the house in which they are living. Satan has come to rob, to kill, to destroy. Sometimes... The demon is manifested, or demon possession is manifested in occultic powers. And many times people deliberately give themselves over to be possessed by demons so that they can possess occultic powers. And uh, this is becoming more common all the time. People are learning the arts of turning yourself over to demonic powers. And of course we have in the United States an, a, a great number of people who are now involved in satanic worship uh, and witchcraft and so forth. The whole idea is to have your body taken over by an evil spirit. And there are people who deliberately seek to do that in order to gain that supernatural power or occultic powers. And just back a couple of chapters uh, in Acts, when we were in the 16th chapter, uh, we find that it came to pass uh, as uh, Paul was going to prayer that there was a certain damsel who was possessed by a spirit of divination. And she met us and she brought her masters a lot of profit by her a soothsaying or ability to sort of tell fortunes. And the same followed Paul and us and cried saying, These men are servants of the Most High God which show us the way of salvation. And this she did for many days, but Paul was grieved and he turned and he said to the Spirit, I command you in the name of Jesus Christ to come out of her. And he came out in the same hour. And... Uh, so the demon had given her the occultic powers of fortune telling. So the story that we have tonight is the story of an aborted attempt to use the name of Jesus in exorcism and uh, the failure of these men to do so. They uh, were overcome by the man, beaten up, and fled for her, their lives. But this story one, it was one that spread throughout the whole area. People heard about this, how that these exorcists, these seven sons of Sceva, how the man with the demon turned on them and beat them up, and they fled from the house. And so it was known, it says, uh, in all... To all of the Jews and the Greeks also who were dwelling in Ephesus. And the result of this was a fear that fell upon them all. And the name of the Lord Jesus was magnified. So the fear 
Uh, the fear of messing around with uh, the spirit powers of darkness. Uh, and uh, then, of course, uh, they began to realize the awesome power of God uh, as manifested through Paul. And they magnified the name of Jesus. Now, Jesus had said to his disciples, Let your light so shine before men that when they see your good works, they will glorify your Father which is in heaven. It is possible to do your good works in such a way as people will glorify you. And unfortunately, that is the way people oftentimes do their good works. Jesus in Matthew 5 said, Now take heed to yourself or be careful about this, that you do not your righteous acts before men to be seen of men. Don't let that be your motive for the righteous things that you do. To do them in such a way as to draw attention to yourself uh, so that men will sort of glorify you. And of course Jesus talked about how uh, when you gave, you weren't to make a big to-do over it. You weren't to play the hallelujah chorus and do a dance and things of that nature. Uh, but uh, you were to just, you know, give to the Father. Don't even let your right hand know what your left hand is doing, it, so to speak. It's, it's just not making a big display of it. When you pray, again, don't do it in such a way as to draw attention to yourself. When you fast, again, uh, don't go around with a long face and uh, look like, uh, you know, you're at the end of the road. And people say, what's wrong with you? Oh, I'm fasting, brother, you know. Uh, uh, not so. Uh, but the Lord said, just carry on normally and do it to your father in secret. And your father who sees in secret he will reward you openly. But if you do it to be seen of man, Jesus said, you have your reward in the oohs, the ahs, and the uh, applause of the people and all. Uh, Jesus said, you have your reward. And so be careful of this. And so obviously Paul is doing things in the right way. Because it, it doesn't say they magnified Paul, but they magnified the Lord Jesus. And so he was doing it in such a way as the people recognized this is the power of Jesus Christ. And rather than magnifying Paul, they were magnifying Jesus. Further result is that many came and they confessed their deeds. That is, the evil, the occultic things that they have been involved in. There was a real revival. People were turning from their uh, dabbling into the occult or their desire to dabble into the occult. Uh, people were turning from the evil. And so they were coming and giving witness, uh, testifying uh, to their turning away from uh, the evil deeds. And then we read in the 19th verse, Many of them also which used the curious arts brought their books together and they burned them before all men. And they counted the price of them and it was found to be 50,000 pieces of silver. Now, that phrase which used curious arts, uh, the use of this word in the Greek writers, we know that it was the magical arts, sorceries, incantations, and so forth. And these abounded in Ephesus. Uh, there was what they called uh, the uh, Ephesus uh, chant, more or less. Uh, there were certain 
uh, words. Uh, and uh, they're recorded in many of the history books. Uh, and there were supposed to be magical powers by chanting uh, these phrases. Uh, I had them, but I won't read them to you because I don't want you even to mess around with it. Uh, but uh, it was uh, incantations. And, and it's sort of like uh, the having your mantra and, and going over your mantra, feeling that it gives you some kind of, of uh, peace or some kind of uh, out-of-body maybe experience uh, as you get caught up in, in the mantra uh, and uh, Dio Cassius, when he was speaking of the emperor Adrian, said Adrian was exceedingly addicted to the curious arts, and he practiced divination and magic. And these practices were prevailing in the ancient world. But they brought their books together, and the Ephesia Grammata, or the Ephesian characters, and this is what I was making reference to, uh, they appeared to have been little uh, amulets uh, or amulets that were inscribed with strange characters, and they were carried about the body for the purpose of curing diseases, expelling demons, and preserving from evils and different kinds of different kinds. And the books were brought together on this occasion, and they were taught the science of uh, this manner of communicating with the uh, spirit world and the use of the charms. Sudas, when he was speaking of the purportedly magic letters, letters which uh, give these powers, said, when Milesius and Ephesius were wrestling at the Olympic Games, Miletius could not prevail because his antagonist had the Ephesian letters bound to his heels. And when this was discovered and he took the letters away, it is reported that Miletius threw him 30 times. This, uh, these words serve no doubt as the keys to the different spells and the incantations that were used in order to gain a variety of ends. So the books were burned that taught these curious arts, such as the Ephesia Grammata or the Ephesian characters, and they no doubt have been convinced of the greater power of Jesus Christ. And so the value of the books was estimated to be 50,000 pieces of silver. Just how much that actually was, we don't know because it doesn't tell us whether it was the Jewish silver, Jewish shekel, or it was the drachma or of the uh, Ephesians, we don't know. Uh, it is estimated that it was anywhere between five and ten thousand uh, dollars, but uh, those are just estimates, and nobody really knows. But we do read a further result was that the word of God grew mightily and prevailed. As a result of the working of God through the life of Paul, now the word of God is just growing mightily and prevailing over the occultic powers that were so prominent in Ephesus. In a few verses down, uh, in our lesson next week, uh, we will find that the influence of Christianity was becoming so strong in Ephesus that it began to affect the industry of the silversmiths who made their living by making little idols of Diana, little charms and bracelets and these various uh, magical things. And, and business was suffering because so many people were turning to Jesus Christ. And so uh, they testified of Paul that the influence of Christianity, they said, was spreading not only there in Ephesus, but through all of Asia. And so from Ephesus, 
because of the work of God's Spirit there. Around the area, in Colossae, in Smyrna, Pergamos, Thyatira, Philadelphia, Hierapolis, Laodicea. Churches were springing up. People were turning to Jesus Christ. It was a real revival. Now after these things had ended, that is, the gospel is now firmly established to the point where Paul feels that he can now move on. You know, the true success of a missionary is when he can turn the mission church over to the local constituencies. That's when you have true success in missions, when you can work yourself out of the job. And you've Train the people and brought them to the place that they can carry on the work without you. Then you have been a successful missionary. If they are continually depending upon you, then you haven't really done your job. It's when you work yourself out of a job that you have true success in the mission field. And so Paul had worked himself out of the job. That is, The people there were now mature enough and they had grown enough that now Paul can move on and he feels that freedom to move on because uh, the people are firmly established now in the word of God and in Jesus Christ. So Paul was wanting to go to Jerusalem But he was wanting to go by way of Macedonia and Achaia. Go back over to the churches in Macedonia that he established, down to Corinth where he had established the church. And his purpose was to collect an offering from these churches, not for himself, but for the church in Jerusalem that was going through great financial difficulties. Paul wanted to see the church united. The Jews had still, though they were Christians, they still had strong prejudices against the Gentiles and even the Gentile believers. They did not see the unity of the body of Christ but they did still feel a superiority because they were Jews. And, and they sort of felt this is ours and, you know, you're just sort of uh, not truly, fully one of us. And Paul was wanting to break down this feeling that existed in the Jewish church. And so it was his purpose because the Jewish church was going through great financial difficulties, Paul's purpose was to go to the Gentile churches, collect a substantial offering from them, and take it and give it to the church in Jerusalem as a goodwill gesture from the Gentile believers. Uh, And I think more or less just to break down this barrier of, of... animosity and prejudice that the Jews felt against the Gentile believers. The body of Christ has no place for any form of prejudice, ethnic or social. This is manifestly wrong. And in as much as in certain times in history and even in the church, There was a manifestation of uh, prejudice. It was evil. It was wrong. It was unchristian. Paul writing said, In Christ there is neither Jew nor Greek, bond or free, male or female. So there is no ethnic nor social uh, differences. 
in Christ we are all one. For he said Christ is all and in all. Now, Paul had this desire to go to Macedonia and then to Corinth and then on back to Jerusalem with this generous offering from the Gentiles. But after that, Paul had a strong desire, a long-standing desire to go to Rome. Paul wanted to go to the capital of the world and use it as sort of a hub from Rome to just get the gospel out into all the world. Paul was just a tireless missionary for Jesus Christ. He got the work established. It's going well. Let's move on. I want to go to Rome and see what God will do in Rome. When Paul wrote to the church in Rome, back in Romans chapter 1, verse 7, he said, To all that be in Rome, beloved of God, called to be saints, grace to you and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. First, I thank my God through Jesus Christ for you all that your faith is spoken of throughout the whole world. For God is my witness whom I serve with my spirit in the gospel of his Son, that without ceasing I make mention of you always in my prayers, making request that if by any means now at length I might have a prosperous journey by the will of God to come to you. He was expressing his, I, I pray that I might be able by the will of God to have a prosperous journey and come to you. For I long to see you that I might impart to you some spiritual gift to the end that you might be established. That is, that I might be comforted together with you by the mutual faith, both of yours and mine. Now I would not have you ignorant, brethren, that oftentimes I purpose to come to you, but I've been hindered up until now that I might have some fruit among you also, even as among other Gentiles. So Paul was expressing to the Romans his desire uh, to come and minister there, uh, that he might have uh, fruit there in Rome also from his ministry. So we read in the 22nd verse, uh, so he sent uh, to Macedonia two of his uh, servants, uh, those that were ministering to him, uh, Timothy and Erastus, but he himself stayed in Asia for a season. How much longer he stayed in Asia, we're not told, uh, but uh, a few months longer. But he sent Timothy and Erastus ahead. Timothy had already been in the churches in Macedonia, so they knew Timothy. He was with Paul when Paul established the churches there. Erastus actually uh, could be the Erastus who was in Corinth. When Paul wrote to uh, the Rome church in Rome in the 16th chapter, uh, he sends them greetings from Erastus, who is the treasurer of the city of Corinth. And uh, so this Erastus could be that same Erastus, uh, who, when he received the gospel through Paul, was so desiring to serve the Lord that perhaps he retired from his position as city treasurer in order that he might just travel with Paul to help Paul in the ministry and to just uh, be a part of what the Lord was doing. We have so many people who have made their mark in the world. They've been successful in the world. And yet they realize that the worldly riches don't bring fulfillment. And so, so many have come and so many are helping us who uh, really just want to do something now that has eternal value. Uh, they've had the value system of the world, the treasures of the world, but they don't satisfy and so their hearts are yearning now to do something that is of eternal value. And uh, we have 
retired lawyers, we have retired CEOs and, and men who have made a success in the world, but it's not fulfilling and, and they're coming to us and they're joining with us. Just as I was there on the East Coast uh, the last couple of days, met so many businessmen, former businessmen, who have uh, been able to retire from their business and now just want to spend the rest of their lives serving the Lord. And, and it's an exciting thing. Uh, and Erastus could be just one of those type of men. The city treasurer. And uh, now Paul is sending him uh, to uh, probably take the offerings and to keep track of the offerings that he might take them to Jerusalem. It's interesting with Erastus, Paul said he was the city treasurer of Corinth. And the interesting thing in just the last few years the archaeologists have uncovered a pavement and uh, in the pavement an inscription that says a gift to the city of Corinth from Erastus, the treasurer. And it confirms uh, the, the scripture that uh, Erastus was indeed, as Paul said, the treasurer of the city of Corinth. And now just in the last few years they've uncovered uh, this pavement with the inscription uh, that this particular section was donated to the city by Erastus. So, uh, Paul will be moving on, but there's going to come pressure to move. And we'll get that in our uh, lesson next week as we see the uh, stir that comes now against the work of God. And, you know, somehow, if you think that you can do God's work without stirring up Satan... You're mistaken, you know. Uh, and, and whenever God is really working, uh, it's going to bring opposition from the enemy's camp. And so uh, we're going to see now opposition that rises because of this great move of the Spirit of God that had taken place in Ephesus. It's going to now create some real opposition. So... We'll look at that in our next lesson. Father, what a joy, what a blessing to see the work that you did there in Ephesus. The lives that were transformed. And Lord, the exciting thing is to realize that one day in heaven, we'll get to meet all these people. And we'll all be one in Christ Jesus. And uh, the body of Christ, complete, gathered together, that we might spend eternity, Lord, with you in your glorious kingdom. All of us, Lord, on one plane, saved by your grace. And so, Lord, we thank you for what you have done then. We thank you for what you're doing now. And Lord, we just pray your continued work and blessing upon the church as we continue, Lord, to just be steadfast, unmovable, always abounding in the work of the kingdom. Guide us, direct us, Lord, in your ways that we might, O oh Lord, Know the joy and the fulfillment of knowing that we have done what you wanted us to do. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.